the previous lecture, uh, we were looking at movement across a membrane by diffusion. So that's movement from areas of high concentration to low concentration. So if we we're going to think about this um, energetically, um, high concentration so, and high energy will move to low concentration, low energy. All right, just kind of like a ball rolling down down a hill right, in a way. All right, you get it started, it's going to move in that direction. Now, what we're going to talk about is active transport. So active transport is going to be movement across a membrane from areas of low to high concentration. So movement from low to high, and we use our notation little brackets, concentration, from low concentration to high concentration. So one of the first things that we want to um, address before we get into the details of it is uh, sort of why that would happen and then how, how, how does that happen? So first off is why? Why would cells move anything from low to high concentration? Well, there, there are a number of reasons for this. Um, a few of them maybe include things like moving nutrients into the cell. So if the cell already has a lot of nutrients, it still wants more nutrients. So it's going to try to bring them in. By diffusion, they would like to move back out of the cell, but the cell is going to keep moving them inward. So it may cost energy to do that, but it's going to be an overall advantage for the cell. The other uh, is the opposite in somewhat of a way is the waste removal. So if cells have a lot of waste built up within them, um, they're going to want to get that out. If the outer environment still has a lot of waste in it, they're not going to allow it to diffuse back in and they still need to push their waste out. So cells are going to have to expend energy for that. In a previous lecture, we talked about membrane potential. So that was a charge difference across the membrane. So where, where it's more positive on one side, more negative on the other. That membrane potential is created by active transport, pushing larger concentrations, say, of positive ions in one direction you know, over the other. So certain um, compartments within the cell may have a lot of hydrogen ions, for example, having a, a very low acidity um, or low pH, making them uh, very acidic. Uh, and in this case, that's because the enzymes within them only work at really low pHs because it's, a, say, a lysosome that's used in, in cellular digestion. So um, there's gonna, a whole bunch of reasons why cells are going to do this. Some of them will come up uh, later on uh, in the course as we go through different lectures. So what we're going to look at now is, is sort of how this happens. Well, the first thing that's going to ha have to happen is somehow the cell's going to need to get and or use energy to do this. So a movement from low to high concentration will cost energy. So this is, say, the equivalent here of diffusion moving from low, from, sorry, from high to low. Active transport would be sort of the opposite, would be moving now from low to high concentration. So active transport would be like a ball rolling up a hill. Okay, so this is active say transport. And you can imagine that's just not not going to happen ever, right? So could a ball roll down a hill all by itself? Sure, make it roll down. So diffusion, diffusion will just happen on its own. Movement from high to low concentration. Will a ball just roll up a hill? Never. Will active transport just happen? No. The cell has to make it happen and it will cost energy in order to occur. So for this energy, there has to be uh, somewhere that the energy is going to come from, right? One of the primary sources of this energy is going to be ATP. Right? We're going to get you know, more detail into ATP, the structure of ATP. If you've already gone through the structure of uh, a nucleotide, like um, the ATGC in DNA and RNA, it's actually pretty much the same structure, right? For an ATP, it's the adenosine triphosphate um, which is like those, those particular molecules. Uh, again, we'll go into the details of it later on in the course. So the cells are going to use ATP for energy, and there's some different ways they're going to, to do that. But that's just one source of energy. Another form of energy that cells could use for active transport uh, is a concentration gradient itself. All right, so what is a concentration gradient? Well, that's an area where there's high concentration and molecules want to move to low concentration. So when that happens, when diffusion occurs, energy is going to be released. Energy can't be 
destroyed, right? So the, the high energy environment, as those molecules move to the low energy envi environment, the energy has to go somewhere. And so it can be given off as heat, it can be transformed into something else within the cell. And in certain cases, the energy of diffusion can actually be used to power active transport. Now we're gonna get into that, into something called uh, co-transport. Uh, there are other things that can, can power it, so light as well, so photons can power uh, active transport, but we're gonna really be focused more so on, on these two. For the ATP type, which is what we're gonna get into first, um, we're gonna look at different types of pumps. So add a little bit more to this. This molecule here, you might recognize it from our discussions of facilitated diffusion as a carrier protein. But now we're gonna be using it in a slightly different way. So what we're gonna have here, and um, we're gonna use the example with, let's just say a hydrogen ion, because we're gonna see this sort of thing in a number of places. And let's say the hydrogen ions here are in a low concentration. And here's an environment where the hydrogen ions are in a high concentration. So as far as diffusion goes, the hydrogen ions would want to diffuse all right, in this direction. That would be the direction of diffusion. And this is what we call a concentration gradient, high, low. But in this particular case, uh, maybe what's going on in the cell is that the cell wants this environment here, this environment needs to have a very high hydrogen ion concentration. It's supposed to have a low pH, it's supposed to be a very acidic environment uh, for a particular reason. And so the cell has to establish this concentration gradient. It has to not allow diffusion to occur. So the hydrogen ions aren't going to get across the phospholipid bilayer. And there's no ion channel for them to just diffuse through. In this case, this carrier protein isn't moving them either. Uh, its job is to do something else. It's going to actually move hydrogen ions into this space. So how, how is that going to work? Well, if in this space here, again, we have the hydrogen ions. Let's say there's a few of them here. But here we have a lot of them. So these are all, all representing the, the hydrogen ions. Okay, so there's a lot of the hydrogen ions in this space. And there are very few in this space up here. But what the cell wants to do is move the hydrogen ions essentially energetically uphill. Right? So it has to move them from low to high concentration. So this protein here now, this is another transmembrane protein, which we're going to call an active transport pump. All right, so an active transport pump. Active transport pumps are going to be transmembrane proteins. Transmembrane proteins. And like other transmembrane proteins, they're going to have binding sites. The binding sites are going to be specific. They're going to have certain shape and size and charge and polarity that's going to attract only very specific molecules or ions or whatever it is that they move across. It's not going to allow anything else to, to move across but one particular very specific thing. So in this case, that specific thing happens to be a hydrogen ion. So hydrogen ions can bind here to this particular active transport pump. Now, like a pump, it needs energy to work. Right, so you can water to get you know up out of the ground um, needs a pump to pump it out. So you can use electricity to power a pump, and that pump can then push water upward. All right, and so in this case, we're going to have to push this right from low to high concentration, and that's going to require energy. Now the ATP that I'm going to draw here could be on either side of the cell uh, membrane. Uh, I'm just going to draw it on this side. Um, well, I'll draw it on this side over here for, for the sake of it. Now, for the ATP as well, we're not going to get into the details of the structure, but for right now, all I'm going to draw is an A, and we're going to go with three Ps like this. Okay, so for adenosine triphosphate, there are three, three phosphates. Okay, one, two, three. So the ATP molecule will come in. Three phosphates. And then this protein, this active transport pump, will have another binding site that can bind the ATP molecule. What's going to happen is it's going to break off one of the phosphates from the ATP. So this phosphate is going to be removed, and as that phosphate is removed, also energy will be released. Now, 
Why specifically does that happen? Why is energy released when the ATP is broken? Um, think about it a little bit. Um, the phosphates okay, of the ATP, they have a negative charge. In order to attach them to one another, it requires energy. You're pushing negative charge against a negative charge. Right? Uh, so that energy then is stored in the chemical bond between the two phosphates. They repel one another. They would like to break apart. So that's part of it. The other thing is, as you build an ATP molecule, you're building something that's fairly organized. So you're decreasing what is called entropy or disorder, right? That is sort of talked a little bit about diffusion as well and, and entropy. That's the, the whole idea uh, behind it. Having a high concentration side means we're more organized in this area, right? And that's a state in nature that is not favored. Disorder is a favored state, which is what we call entropy. So in this case, by breaking it, we're creating more entropy, more disorder, breaking things into pieces. You drop something, it shatters into pieces. It happens, right? Will it ever reassemble itself all on its own? No. Could it be reassembled? Yes, if energy was expended to reassemble it. So we could put things back together, but it costs energy. Breaking them apart often even releases energy and is a more natural thing. So in this case, by breaking the ATP, it's creating more entropy. It's put, getting negative things to separate. So this is going to release energy. So one of these phosphates is going to come off. And now we're going to have different types of pumps. And these pumps here, P-type, V-type, and F-type, are going to use ATP. The first one we're going to look at is the, the P-type pump. And if you P, looking at here, related to the, the phosphate. Okay. So with the P-type pump, the phosphate that was broken off of the ATP is going to actually attach to the protein itself. So now the ADP, there's two phosphates here, will go away. And the energy that was released when the bond was broken will be transferred to this protein. That protein can now change shape. So what's going to happen is that protein will move that particular, in this case, it's an ion, uh, across the membrane by changing its shape. So now this uh, hydrogen ion, which is going into the membrane here, the ATP binds to it, breaks off a phosphate, releases energy. That energy is transferred to the protein. So the protein changes shape. Okay, so the protein changes its shape. It flips uh, its orientation. And now, again, this is, this is not diffusion, uh, what's happening here. And diffusion would want to happen in the opposite direction, but movement in this direction is active transport. So while the hydrogen ions would like to leave this area and move in the opposite direction, instead they're being pushed, or what we call pumped, into this particular space. And that's what we call active transport. And so the active transport requires energy. The energy in this particular case is coming from ATP. And in a P-type pump, the P from the ATP, a phosphate, is actually attached to the protein. All right, so that's this first one. Now. These other types we're going to talk about here very briefly, um, just to give you the definitions of them. Essentially the same thing is going to happen, um, and I'm not going to go over even different examples. I'm just going to use the same example, but just talk about it in a slightly different way. Okay. So if we're talking about now a V-type pump, something called a V-type pump, it works pretty much the same way as the P-type pump. It's an active transport pump. It binds a specific molecule or ion on one side of the membrane, pushes it from low to high concentration. In this case, the V-type pump will bind the ATP, but when it breaks it, the phosphate that was attached to the ATP is just broken and released. It's not held on to by the protein. You just break it. So energy is just released. The phosphate is also released. And the P doesn't stay there. Right? This is going to come. We're going to do another example of a, of a P-type pump in a little bit. And, and another uh, lecture on the sodium-potassium pump uh, down here. And then we'll see additional purpose for having the phosphate be attached. Okay. But right now we have a P-type pump. It stays attached. A V-type pump, it's used, but it's just goes away. So you can think my little arrow here, maybe it looks like, like a V. So you, it binds and then it breaks free in terms. The energy is still transferred to the protein, which allows it to be used as a pump and it still pushes something from low to high concentration. 
Now, an F-type pump is something a little bit different, and we will get uh, later in the course into more detail on F-type pumps. Now, an F-type pump is also going to use ATP, but let me erase this for just a second here, erase it, and uh, an F-type pump is unique in that an F-type pump is reversible. So these other pumps, they only work in a particular direction. Right? They push something from one side of the membrane to the other, and that is through active transport. And they do not allow diffusion back in the other direction. They only work and pump in one direction. But an F-type pump is unique. The F-type pump is unique because it is reversible. And later we'll talk about um, something called an FOF1, ATPase, which is a pump, a uh, transmembrane protein in the mitochondria. And it's really the site where most all of your cellular ATP is made or manufactured. And it can do both active transport using ATP for energy, but it can also do facilitated diffusion. So if this were an F-type pump here, what that means is that it could allow, it could kind of reverse this process and it could allow not active transport, but it could allow the, the ion to go into the protein. It'll change shape and then allow diffusion to occur. So if diffusion were to occur, energy would actually be released instead of required. And in this case, the energy would be used to take an ADP and add a phosphate to it. So the energy can be used to actually make an ATP. So this is something, again, we're going to go into this in, in a lot more detail later on in the course. But F-type pumps are another type of active transport pump that can use ATP. So it can, it can do active transport. It can bind ATP, break it, and then push the thing from low to high concentration. But in addition, it can go backwards, right? It's reversible. It can then do diffusion and allow something to move from high to low concentration and then take that energy to remake an ATP molecule. So it can use ATP or it can make ATP, and that's an F-type pump. All right, so active transport is going to be a process that requires energy. The energy can come from a number of sources. We'll talk about some other sources later, but right now we're looking at ATP. You can use ATP and bind a phosphate P, and hold on to it. That's the P-type pump. You can use ATP and just break it but not hold on to it. That's the V-type pump. You can use ATP to do active transport but also allow the pump to be reversible and make ATP. And that's what we call an F-type pump. So these are three types of active transport pumps that use ATP. And I'm just using hydrogen ions here as an example. We will look at hydrogen ions specifically in the course in several different uh, places. Um, but this could be a sugar molecule. This could be glucose being pumped you know, into the cell. It could be an amino acid. It could be anything. All right. We're just using the, um, this hydrogen ion as, a, as an example here. So the next thing we're going to get into is the sodium potassium pump, which is a type of P-type pump. And we're going to do that in the, the next uh, lecture.